Okay, good afternoon. I'm Janine Castello Lynn from the Berkeley Historical Society. Um, I'm here with Tonya Staros, uh, also from the Berkeley Historical Society. And we had the great pleasure of interviewing former mayor of Berkeley, Gus Newport, today. Um, so, Gus, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Um, so, we're going to start at the beginning. Um, but uh, um, we're, we're going to ask you, you know, when when you were born and, and where and where did you grow up? Those kinds of questions. I was born uh, in Rochester, New York, during the Depression, April 5th, 1935. Uh, my grandmother and mother had moved there from the South where they had gone through real harassment, whatever. Turns out that my great grandmother was a slave and my grandmother shared those stories of in later days, but I grew up in Rochester, New York. Okay. And um, growing up, were your parents or your family or your people in your community political? Not necessarily political, but they believed in the beloved community. My grandmother and mother were both very active in the church, but even though they had gone through great race problems, they uh, honored everybody. We lived in a poor neighborhood, and a lot of young white female teachers were moving in because of affordable housing. And my grandmother always hosted a reception for them. And from the old Southern perspective, had us kids call them Aunt Jane or Aunt Joan or Aunt Ruby, whatever it might be. But it so it, it created a real comfortable community uh, perspective with real respect, and everybody enjoyed one another. I to learn from one another. What what church did your family attend? Oh, uh, we turned uh, Mount Olivet Baptist. Uh, which was the, the minister was a guy named Charles Body, who was very well known. His father and uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell's father were great friends, and he was very active. He later went on to be the president of the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville, Tennessee. But he was a, he was he was a gifted person. He started taking uh, Walter Scott, who was brightest young guy in our neighborhood and myself when we were 12 years old across the state of New York on a debate team to debate other youngsters about problems and methods of the day. So that's how we got some of the exposure that did become, you know, political and community activists, et cetera, and whatever else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you were at in high school, did you continue debating? No, not necessarily. Uh, I was active in sports and in the school band. I, I played football. Matter of fact, I ended up getting a scholarship to college through football. I, I guess you could say I debated because I remember my friends and even older people talking about uh, you're you're always in a discussion, Gus. And, my minister, when he put me on the debate team, said, I'm going to take you with me because if I leave you out here, all the talk you got, you'll get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Sound, sounds like you were pro promising. And so um, where um, where did you get the, the, the college football scholarship to? The Heidelberg uh, University in Tiffin, Ohio, a small evangelical and reform school that was actually associated with the great Heidelberg University in Germany. Hmm. And uh, oddly enough, there was only one black family in the town of Tiffin, only seven blacks in the college, but uh, it was a place that I enjoyed. I didn't stay through my graduation. Uh, coming from a poor family, which I was the first one in my family to finish high school didn't have the background, wasn't necessarily prepared. So I dropped out of college in my first try there. 
and then went back, dropped out again, and then I got drafted in the military. And oddly enough, coincidentally, after my basic training, I got assigned to Heidelberg, Heidelberg Germany. That is a coincidence. Yes. Yes. So um, what, what years were you uh, in, the, in the military and then in Heidelberg? I was in the military in 1958 to 1960, and I started at Heidelberg University in 1954. I actually uh, was discharged early from the military, although it was honorable, because they put me in intelligence, and I asked a lot of questions. They were testing atomic bombs in caves there in Germany, and the, the, um, the wall was being built in Berlin and things like that. And I had a lot of questions. They put me in charge of boat locators for all United States military boats throughout the world. And I just had too many questions. And finally, they called me in and said, look, Newport, we're discharging you. It was honorable, but they put me out a couple of months early. But that was a part of my activism, I guess. Yes, shows your character early on. And so then um, after you were discharged from the military, where did you go and, and what did you do? I went, moved back to, to Rochester. Um, the Civil rights movement was in full sway then. And uh, Rochester was one of two cities that had two race riots, but because my family was so active, they ended up making me head of the largest civil rights group in Rochester, the Monroe County Nonpartisan Political League. And there was a massive police brutality case on a gas station attendant who was black. It took place in Rochester. And I headed that case up, raised money for the gas station attendant's hospitalization and his family. And it was the first case won in a federal court in the United States. Uh, on that kind of massive brutality. Wow. Well, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's something. So I guess you, you, you really had sort of jumped uh, feet first into the, the civil rights uh, movement. And um, so did you, did you stay in Rochester and continue to work? I stayed in Rochester for a while, yes. And shortly after the Rufus Farewell case, the first one, the police invaded the Black Muslim Mosque in Rochester. And Daisy Bates, who history remember for integrating the schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, was in Rochester organizing for the NAACP. Malcolm X called her and said, Daisy, I got to come to Rochester to find out why they invaded uh, our mosque. And she gave him my phone number without letting me know. So when Malcolm X called me, I was taken aback. And he talked for about two hours that first time. And then we talked for two hours every night for two weeks. Mm. He, flew in, he flew into Rochester on a cold February day. In Rochester, New York, it's cold. It's on Lake Ontario, right across from Canada. And in those days, the planes landed on a tarmac. And I was inside the airport waiting, surrounded by all these white men in white shirts and, and ties and felt hats and I thought they were just business people waiting to catch a plane down to New York City. Malcolm's plane lands on the tarmac. They let the stairs down. He gets down, walks in. He walks into the airport. We had never seen each other. He said, who is Gus Newport? I said, I am, sir. He said, young blood, you got the best tap telephone in America. This is all FBI here. So <laughs> that, that was the beginning of my meeting Malcolm. And the press started laughing. There were people there that wanted to hear the discussion. And then we went from there to uh, the police jail to get the Muslims out. They hadn't been eating any food because being Muslims, they didn't believe in pork. They just drank milk. We got them out and uh, took them to feed them and then took them to trial where they were set free. Oh. So, yeah, it sounds like you really um, forged a strong relationship then with, uh, 
with with Malcolm X. Um, yeah, we, we, we became very strong. He continued to return to Rochester for meetings and for discussions. As a matter of fact, something happened because that first day he spoke at a nonprofit organization to a public audience. And the next day, the New York State Legislature passed a law that Malcolm X could not be allowed to speak in any political or nonprofit organization in the state of New York. In 24 hours, they passed that law. So, so what did Malcolm do in, in response? What can you do when the state legislature or the Congress of the United States passed the law? He just come and, and, and the church is invited him to come back and speak. Now, there was some problems because the NAACP and some of the churches didn't want to have so much of a relationship with Malcolm because in the early days, the black Muslims were, you know, um, were not an integrating force in this land. But Malcolm reminded me, we're all black. We all have problems. So we should learn to work with one another, love one another, and begin to understand how we deal with the problems we as African Americans, former slaves. Remember, we're the only immigrants in this country that were brought to this country against our will on boats and things. And so as time went on, he became more and more respected in the people of Rochester really loved Mel. Hmm. So did you formally start working for Malcolm after that? Within a year or so, I couldn't keep a job in Rochester, so I moved to New York where his headquarters was. And I worked for IBM because I'd learned the old um, punch card, electric data processing, computers and things in the military. I went to work for IBM and RUAC. And I got to participate with Malcolm on a lot of things and Adam Clayton Powell. And then later Malcolm created an organ when he got set down from the um, Nation of Islam by Elijah Muhammad because of the remarks he made about the chickens coming home to roost when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And that was misinterpreted what he said to the media. He was saying that because John F. Kennedy, when he was running for re-election, getting ready for re-election, brought both the Ku Klux Klan and the uh, Nation of Islam together because they were both separatists and wanted to be separated in parts of the southeast part of the United States and Georgia. And Malcolm thought that was wrong. And uh, so he got set down for 90 days and then they didn't take him back into the nation. He created something first called Muslim Mosque Incorporated, then the Organization of Afro-American Unity. He invited me to help him form the organization. Was that nationwide or? Well, it was based, it was based in New York, speaking, but it did become nationwide. And as, we, as a result, he became respected as an international Muslim Islam and was put on the board of, the, uh, of, of Islam in Geneva, Switzerland, as the international board. Where was Malcolm living at this time? Was he in New York City where you were? He was he was living he was living in Queens, New York, uh, which is out on the island, sort of. And uh it was there where his house was firebombed. And a few days after his house was firebombed in 63, he called me and asked if I would fly to Rochester with him, where he'd been invited to speak at Colgate Divinity and at Cornhill Methodist Church to speak about his situation, make people understand Islam more. Um, he had stopped calling white people devils as he did when he was in the Nation of Islam and stuff, and said, I wanna be friends with all people. So I flew to Rochester with him. I called a couple of my old friends who were on the police force. They met us on the tarmac because his life was in threat. He spoke at Cornhill Methodist Church and at Colgate Divinity. That night, we sat up in his hotel room with a lot of people and talked all night. And he and I flew back to New York 
the following day. And this was four days before he was assassinated. When we landed in LaGuardia, we were met by the chief of police of New York in the fire marshal. And they accused him of firebombing his own home. And although Malcolm had stopped cussing and swearing and drinking or anything like that when he became a Muslim, he called them uh, two fellows some names I'd never heard before. But, uh, um, and his wife picked him up and took him downtown to meet with Alex Haley, who was writing his, his story. And that was the last time I saw Malcolm because I lived up in White Plains. He used to go in every Sunday for our meeting. Uh, but I didn't go that Sunday because I was tired. My cousin called me that afternoon, the day he was assassinated, and said, Gus, where you at? I said, I'm home. She said, stay home. Malcolm X was assassinated. And so you want to tell the, the viewers how um, who assassinated him and, and how did how how did that happen? Still, as a matter of fact, I'm 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 a part of a film that's being made now to look at the court hearings and all those things. The very next day after his assassination, the FBI came to my house early the next morning, asking me where my guns were and all that kind of food, just this and that. And I went to the uh court proceedings on, on his assassination with his wife, Betty, and some things. But they seemed to have uh, fingered the wrong people. And we knew that something was up because in Harlem and the Bronx, a couple of weeks prior to and right up until the time he was assassinated, there were police on the roofs of all the major high-rise buildings and things in New York and Harlem and in the Bronx. So something was certainly up. We've got information from a policeman who had uh, entered the, uh, the, the the nation in the uh, the organization of Afro American Unity. He then infiltrated. This guy later became so he respected Malcolm so much, he became an alcoholic, and on his records to the police reports he told. The police, how much he learned to respect Malcolm and whatever else. His boss was a white captain who we've talked to in the last couple of years who gave us some of those records and whatever else. So, and also, after Malcolm went on the Hajj, when he came back, we had a meeting at Sidney Portier's house. Juanita Portier, Sidney's wife, hosted a meeting with Ozzie Davis and Ruby D and various other people. And um, it was agreed that Malcolm would go before the United Nations, where he often did, and file a suit against American hegemony, imperialism, and colonialism. And also, Juanita told him, said, Malcolm, don't you ever call white folks devils again. Said, look at you, you got green eyes. Malcolm's mother was half white. And he had debated uh, somebody at Oxford in Britain, uh, one of the greatest scholars. And during that debate, this guy was getting beat. So he stopped, he said, Malcolm, I just want to stop a minute. I thought you said you were going to stop calling white people devils. He said, I am. He paused for a minute. He said, I am. But who's going to replace you all? So the place broke out laughing. But he, he was quite a person. I mean, Malcolm was one of the dearest friends I've ever had and one of the greatest pe people I most greatly respected. Mm. So you must have been very affected by his assassination. I was very, 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 very affected. You know, I walked around with my head down. I was working at IBM. Um, they tried to call me in and get me to change my politics. They wanted me to, to join the, the IBM had um, their own country club. They wanted me to join the country club. They tried to tell you I was single at the time, what kind of woman you should go out with. Wanted me to wear white shirts and ties and all that stuff, and I didn't abide by it. Eventually, they had me train a whole lot of people because of my knowledge and stuff, but eventually I moved back to Rochester. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did, while I was there, some of the great jazz musicians of the time, Dizzy Gillespie, Max Roach, 
Miles Davis and others did a big fundraiser at Sidney Poitier's house to raise money to buy Malcolm's wife a home up in Westchester. She was eight months pregnant when he got assassinated. Mm. So I moved her from Queens to the house and she had four, four kids already. And her aunt and I, she did, they had the wallpaper in this house had velvet in it. She didn't like it. So we had to clean all the wallpaper off, steam it, and paint the house. But I took her to the hospital when she delivered the twins. And we became very close friends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was, was she supported by the community? Or how, how did she manage with her six children? No, she got a scholarship. And she went to... Amherst to get her PhD. Mm. But then because of the many records and books and things that was written about Malcolm, she asked me to be her agent. I told her I, I didn't know enough about this stuff. But she ended up getting rights to all his recordings and books. So she, be, she became a millionaire. So back to your trajectory, um, you moved to Berkeley in 76, is that right? No, I actually moved to Berkeley in 74. 74, okay. Yeah. Is there, I, mm -hmm, go ahead. I had been working for the Department of Labor in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And uh, in 74, because of, uh, Nixon was president at the time, and a lot of people were leaving government because we didn't like his politics and stuff. I uh, resigned from the Department of Labor, and I had a cousin working for the city of Berkeley, and she asked me if I'd come to help develop some youth employment services programs. So I did that in early 74, and then I did a wage comparability survey for nonprofit organizations. Then I went to work for the city of Berkeley as a senior analyst, both in recreation and parks and in the city manager's office. And I was very active in BCA. And then I ended up on the board of BCA. And in 1977, some people had asked me to run for city council. And uh, in my neighborhood, I would have been going against a guy named Mark L, who was very active on a lot of committees. And I backed out. And then in 1979, BCA drafted me to run for mayor. I didn't want to. I, did, I never aspired to be pol in politics. I wanted to be active in public policy and stuff, but I wasn't. So I said no, but John Denton, who was already on the city council, a white lawyer who was uh, older than I wasn't active, he was hat in the ring. So we ended up having a runoff. And on the second week, I drew more votes than he did to be BCA's candidate. That's how I ended up running for mayor of Berkeley. Mm -hmm. When you, it was, it was kind of a, a quick trajectory to, to you sort of, uh, to become mayor. And um, were you, um, did you feel like you were, you were prepared? Like you, you knew what you were going to do or you were like, hmm. Well, I, I was prepared, but I was lucky enough to be able to hire a staff and put together a good team. I had work, as I said, uh, in, um, Park and Recreation for the City of Berkeley and in the City Manager's Office. I was also responsible for public relations and stuff for the city for a while. Mm -hmm. So I had general knowledge and I had worked for other areas of government in other parts of the country. So we, we put an initiative on the ballot when I ran that uh, if it passed, that we would divest from South Africa. Berkeley became the first city in the country to divest from South Africa. Then we had to put together affidavits for business to sign and whatever else do that. But we also um, put an initiative on the ballot to, to create, create funds for childcare. 
because our assessment showed us that more women would be able to work if they had access to funds for childcare because childcare costs so much. And then going forward, there have been a lot of shootings with our police force and whatever else. And I work with the Institute for the Study of Social Change at the University of California at Berkeley. They made me a fellow. They helped us gather the data to understand how to reform police departments to make sure that new police, you know, had at least a, a two-year degree and um, that they understood the analysis, but we also raised money to give to nonprofits to develop more people for training. We hired mental health advocates to work the streets with police officers because of some of the unnecessary shootings and things that were going on, whatever. We reformed the police department. There was no shootings by the police department in Berkeley for the next 10 years. And, and, and things got better. So that was real learning situation. We also, Holly Near, who headed up the uh, new music station, uh, and I got to be real good friends in, um, what's his name, the uh, first gay that was on the city council in San Francisco. Harvey Milk. Harvey, Harvey Milk was a good friend. He used to come over to Berkeley a lot of times, speaking with BCA and stuff. And he had tried to pass a domestic benefits initiative for gays and their partners in San Francisco. And when he got killed, Diane Feinstein became the mayor. And she went to the Catholic Church and she stopped it. Mm. So his replacement came to me and said, we think you're the only mayor in the U.S. that can pass domestic benefits. So I went down to uh, the state capitol to look at how, how benefits work and all that, and if passing domestic benefits would raise economically, the city's budget found out that was wrong. That was just the right wing. So we passed domestic benefits, and we became the first city in the country to pass domestic benefits also. Jane mm -hmm. Fonda worked with us. Matter of fact, Jane Fonda did a fundraiser for me the first time I ran for city council for, 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 for mayor. Wow. So it, it was quite a learning situation. I know that you were very internationally oriented. You mentioned South Africa, and I know we have photos of you in Nicaragua. So how did you become, uh, as a mayor, so interested in, in, in reaching out internationally? Well, I was a uh, vice president from the U United States Peace Council, from vice, one of the vice presidents, and I was vice president from the US, the World Peace Council. Hmm. and. Uh, attended many meetings in places like Vienna, London, uh, Havana, uh, Athens, Greece, etc., whatever else. And I was actually nominated in 1991 to become president of the World Peace Council on the same day that Nelson Mandela was released from prison. But I would have had to live in Athens, Greece, and I love the Greek people. I got there many times, uh, traveled to one of the Mount Olympus with a, a, a mountain climbing group and whatever else. But my allergies are pretty rough. It gets so hot in Athens in the summertime. As a matter of fact, they had a law that cars would even license plates could ride drive on one day in odd place another day because of of, of, of of the gas fumes and everything else in Athens. So I decided not to accept it, but but I was nominated to become president of the World Peace Council. I would have had to live in Athens to do that. This was in 1990. Um, well, we've talked about some of the highlights of your mayoral time, but probably there were others. Would you like to, to mention? I was nominated to the advisory committee of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And I was one of five nationwide in that position. 
during my five years, I also chaired the subcommittee on education uh, and employment for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. So I became fairly well known and 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 quite active. You know, I you know had good relationships with the unions of the city of Berkeley. Um, we did a lot of stuff around public housing. In those days, there was a there was a law in the book at one time saying that cities had to create new master plans. Like supposedly every five years, most cities never did it for any less than 20. But each year you had to send in a percentage of how much affordable housing that you think you would build to the state. And Berkeley usually submitted a, a, a study of about 30%. And um, we did a lot of things about our, our, our rent control was passed and then the landlords filed a suit against our, our, our rent control. Our rent control went all the way to the Supreme Court. And Lawrence Tribe, who was a, a lawyer at Harvard, who knew the Supreme Court better than anybody, took our case on pro bono, and we won it. We had said that rent, rent increases couldn't be any higher than 1% because of the state of the economy and things at that time, and it passed. And so as you encounter all these kinds of things, you know, you begin to get a better understanding and analysis. And then we had another case where students at University of California, Berkeley, both the uh, Jewish students and the Palestinian students came together as partners. And they wanted to talk about the state of what was happening in uh, Israel. And we put an initiative on the ballot that said, if it passed that I, the mayor of Berkeley, would send a letter to the president and secretary of state that the United States should send no more money to developing housing in the settlements in Gaza and places like that. Noam Chomsky came out and campaigned with us. Uh, Lawrence Tribe and other people uh, came out, national people to care. It was de defeated handily, but in other cities picked it up. Cambridge, Massachusetts did it and passed it. And uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and things like that. And so Barbara Lubin was on the city council. She became president of the city school board. And BCA had asked her to ask me not to endorse this initiative. And I said, am I doing something wrong? And she said, no, but after she served on the school board for one year, she went over to Israel. She's a Jew. Her father was a, a, a lawyer, but, but a Zionist. She went over there when she saw what was happening in Gaza and other places. She come back. And that's when she created the Middle East Children's Alliance, which I became the chairman of the board for, it's been like 32 years now. I've just finally stepped if you have, looking back, some reflections on the kind of unique two-party system in Berkeley at that time. I mean, the BCA on the and left, BD, the BDC, BD, BDC, yeah. the Berkeley Democratic Club. Yeah, I think it basically reflected the makeup of people in the city. I mean, BCA was very progressive. To the left, BDC was middle of the road. Uh, still very Democrat oriented, party oriented, but um, they were not as union organizing or even around rent control and, 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 and affordable housing as we were. Most of the people at BDC lived up in the hills and, you know, were somewhat middle class or wealthy and BCA was more working class than things like that. Um, however, when it came down to votes often, um, majority of time, um, we agreed, like when I first got elected, BCA only had four seats on the council. BDC had five. Um, eventually that changed by the time I, I left. 
PCA had eight seats on the council. Um, but we got together on some things. I remember when I ran for re-election, I didn't want to, but they talked me into it. My opponent was Shirley Dean, who was on BDC. And uh, I beat her by the biggest plurality ever in the history of the city. And she wouldn't speak to me for a, a few years, but we have since become friends again. And I remember when Jesse Ergon first ran, she and I did a fundraiser together for her. So uh, live and learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Well, we've heard stories from, from both sides that there was a lot of acrimony between the two parties. I think was uncomfortable for, for a lot of people at the time. And um, I don't, it sounded sound like it got fairly personal as opposed to just political. I don't know if you have any reflections on that. When I was running for election again against Shirley Dean, and I was talking about community and economic development, and uh, the moderator of the panel said, well, Shirley Dean, what do you have to say about community and economic development? And she repeated word for word almost everything I said. Well, that's interesting that, that actually your positions, the positions of the parties might not have been so so different, but somehow the parties, like, I don't know, different football teams. It was different on affordable housing and rent control uh, and on some of the union stuff. And, uh, but I think, like, I think from a international perspective on militarism, I think we were all against war, as most Berkeley, Berkeleyans are and whatever else. So there were certain things that we could always come together on. How did you feel about the move to district elections in 1986? I didn't feel feel good about it because uh, Berkeley is a city only nine square miles, and uh, district elections meant that, that every district would be fighting for its district rather than looking at a collective picture for the good of the city, and it was very uh, disturbing and divisive from my standpoint. And uh, proved to be the case somewhat, but uh, that was just politically where I was coming from. In 1986, is it true that all of the elected officials, city council members and mayor had to run again? That was part of the charter initiative? When we changed from what used to be April 1st or something to November. So it would coincide with the state. And so, although I was mayor for two terms, which ordinarily would have been eight years, my total time in office is like seven years and 10 months or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, in 86, you didn't run for, for re-election? No, no. I had gone through a divorce, and I was had really, as I said, politics wasn't necessarily my thing anyway. I was invited by the U University of Massachusetts at Boston to be the first senior fellow at the William Monroe Trotter Institute. And I left and moved to Boston and took that position for a year. Did you ever return? To, to live in Berkeley after that? No. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I live in Oakland now. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think from there, I did that term at UMass Boston. And then um, right after that, I was invited back to Rochester, New York, my hometown, to head up a department for the county of Monroe, which is where Rochester is, mm -hmm. on aid services and things. 
mm -hmm. nonprofits, and there was a lot of churches against aid services and all that stuff. And my job was going to some of the churches and make them aware that LGBTQ were all human beings and such of it, and treat them with equal respect. I thought the Bible said God loves all children. And uh, I did that for a while. And then I was invited out to the University of California, Santa Cruz, to teach as a senior fellow to teach a course for a while. And then I was invited back to Boston to head up an organization called the W Street Neighborhood Initiative, which is the only community nonprofit group in the history of the United States to get eminent domain authority after creating a master plan um, that was allowed by the legislation. In, in the state of Massachusetts. So it was just a constant learning and growing around community land trust and learning more about community development and planning. But I never again lived in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Did you keep some of your ties, your friendships and? Oh yeah, your... I, I, uh, I have ties and still have friends as a matter of fact. Una Chima and Moni Law and people like that have me on all kinds of commissions in Berkeley right now. And through Zoom, I participated in a lot of meetings around some of the public policy stuff that they're still pursuing. Mm -hmm. So when did you move back to Oakland? 1991, 92. I, I actually moved back here in 91, but I went back and forth to Boston, so they found my replacement in 92, but I moved, actually moved back here in 92. Mm -hmm. I have since lived a couple of other places. I I lived in New Orleans for three years after Katrina. Uh, Danny Glover and Harry Belafonte raised some money for special television, fundraiser to help nonprofits in New Orleans. And they asked me and Dave Dennis, so we actually ended up living in New Orleans for three years. I was on the planning commission to rebuild New Orleans after that. So I have lived, lived in New Orleans. It's another place I live. I've been around a little bit. Yes, def definitely. So how did you decide to come back to Oakland? Um, my present wife's father, who was a doctor, became quite ill and she was a affordable housing planner. So she came back and Ellie Harris was the mayor of Oakland at the time. And uh, I was able to get her a job helping them to plan around housing. And then I came back and we rented the place for a while in Oakland, did bought a house. And then uh, a few years ago, we moved to uh, Rockridge. I live in Rockridge, right? Okay, almost Berkeley. Yes, right, very cool. <laughs> that area is very, I would say, liminal, liminal area there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Did your time as mayor of Berkeley affect your post-mayor mayoral career? I think so. I became much more knowledgeable and active in community planning. You know, recognizing the role that HUD and the federal government had played in gentrification, and of course, white supremacists coming up from the South, starting Britain 1619 or whatever else. So the method of rebuilding communities and learning was a learned thing that I got much more involved with. So. It, it had a, a, a great impact. And even to this day, um, my age, I'm 86, I'm still involved in some community planning up in Seattle and Spokane and other places people call on me because of some of my background and whatever. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've been invited. We're making a film out of Hollywood on a Native American woman who grew up on a reservation side of Spokane. And her family moved her into a 
well-to-do white community where she finished high school. Then she became a basketball star and, 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 and became all country in basketball. And, um, she didn't, they wanted her to go into the WNBA, but she decided to go to law school because she wanted to learn more about building the reservations and making things better for Native Americans. So Danny Glover, the movie star and activist, and I are very much involved with that along with Lenny Wilkins. And we're in the process of making that film now. Also, Danny Glover had worked for the city of Berkeley in the planning department, his first job out of college. And uh, so I stay active. We're, we're very active together. Another question. It's uh, a little more, um, I guess, not quite global, but national about looking back, do you see different eras in America's politics of the 80s, 90s, and, and 2000s? Like um, eras that were begun by certain important events. Or, as we look at the nature of cities, you know, I say I grew up in Rochester, New York, which is part of the Rust Belt. And Rochester used to be a high manufacturing city, as was Buffalo, as was Cleveland, as was Detroit. But those cities are in bad, bad shape now. And if you stop and think about the politics of those eras, right after the end of the Second World War, the wealthy manufacturers believed in deindustrialization. So they moved all the manufacturing goods to cheap labor markets in other parts of the world and sucked the blood out of jobs. For instance, when I lived in Rochester, Eastman Kodak used to employ 80,000 people. Xerox used to employ 65,000. Bausch & Lomb's another 50,000. Today, Kodak employs 6,000 people. Xerox, maybe 3,000. Bausch and Lomb is, is practically nil. And that's what happened to the decline in the Rust Belt. But most Americans have no knowledge of that in general. During these pandemic times, for instance, we're talking about how we're going to have to plan to rebuild cities because most people are working virally and whatever else. They're not going to necessarily come back. Although when you look around Berkeley and Oakland, you see all these market rate condos going up. Well, Who's going to live in those places if they're not coming back? Some of that could become affordable housing. We could put solar panels on them to create energy and things like that. It has to be a public thinking. And the fact is, you mentioned socialism in the United States, and we just stepped back. Oh, that's awful. Let's talk about communism. Well, the average American doesn't know what socialism is. We in America are 43rd in the world in education, 72nd in healthcare. And we don't even have a basic analysis of that. And of course, during this pandemic time, we're so limited because of whatever. I mean, look at how many people are fighting taking any kind of vaccine or this and that. And how some of the right wing is saying we don't need that. Where are we at for the goodness of people? The best good. America's sunk a long way. And I would hope that as things turn around, we get together again because. I say our education system has gone way down. Um, it's like the federal government sort of took over to deciding what education would be. But when I was a kid, we had all kinds of sciences, et cetera, whatever else. But we also had music and arts. They taught us tap dancing and ballrooms and dancing and things like that. All these things are integrated that gives you the spiritual concept of what education, what love should be all of the about. And today, the average American knows so little about that, especially the working class, et cetera, whatever else. And of course, we got a lot of immigrants coming here. But as I said, the Native Americans were the first and only people here. I mean, immigrants uh, came here. I mean, the British came over, and then they decided, well, uh, Britain decided, well, Remember, they used to say the sun never sets on the British Empire. Then Britain decided, after the U.S. became a, a, a society, that they wanted to build a lot of cloth, clothing for 
they can soup some things, but they needed cotton to do that. So America was a place to create the cotton. That meant America had to get slaves to grow the cotton and all this. And that. So it's, it's like having an analysis of all that thing and look going forward, what all this stuff has landed to. Now we got boats sitting out in the, in the harbor. We can't even get goods and supplies in. They're talking about the cost of goods is going up. Won't have toys and things for Christmas. Won't have turkeys and all that stuff because those ships and cargoes are sitting there. We ain't got no truck drivers, et cetera, whatever else. We got to think about how do we remake all this stuff when we got an operable and functional society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're. I'm, I'm sure you've seen a lot of change in the in the in the in, this, in Rochester and in, in what you call the Rust Belt, where you came from. That, as you say, people don't see so much out here in Berkeley, and um, so yeah, definitely. There's a, there's a um, I guess a lot that you can you can speak about to to people in this this part of the country we don't we don't really see it so much yeah and we all got to learn to work together like one thing was good when i was mayor uh troy duster who founded the institute for the study of social change at the university of california berkeley who was a grandson of ida b wells invited me to be a fellow and helped me gather data and learn to plan he also hosted uh wine and cheese gatherings for academics and community activists twice a month in his house. He also planned with Ira Heyman, who was chancellor of the university, for him and I to have breakfast meetings twice a year. So you had to have a work to take the best of the intelligence and whatever to help us do this planning, et cetera, and whatever else. I think we got to go back to those days and look at that which is most beneficial to us and benevolent to making us a better society and community. And of course, during this pandemic time, COVID-19, I mean, poor people with children, nobody was thinking about what all they had to deal with and what we have to do going forward. We should all be a part of helping adults with children, educate them, plan, et cetera, whatever else, if we believe in a truly beneficial society going forward. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're you're connected with current politicians. You mentioned Jesse Araguin, so um, maybe you're you have you have some people who are in power now. They're they're ear and are talking to them about these things. I imagine, yeah. Well, um, I see that uh, our uh, I think our hour is up, and um, I wanted to to thank you very much for um, this interview and sharing your, your life with us. You had some remarkable experiences and um, we look forward to hearing from you on the upcoming panel.